next installment of the World Affairs Council Upstate as we celebrate Earth Week here with our special guest lecturers. This is part of the America and the World Flashpoint Edition Lecture Series, where we highlight regional and national experts on given global impact issues. Um, today, our celebration about Earth Week continues as we discuss the, um, the cost of a clean planet, how carbon-based fuels affect us here at home through industry and also abroad, and how various countries, and particularly underdeveloped countries, are impacted through um, climate change fees and carbon fuel decisions. So um, I want to let you know just a little bit, first of all, about our organization. We are completely non-political and non-partisan. That's very important because we want to bring you the best information we can so that you can ask your own questions and make your own decisions. I would ask you if you're just joining us, please turn off your video. Um, your audio will be muted. We'll put all of our questions through the chat function on your Zoom. Um, type in your questions and our moderator will filter them to our guest speakers. If you're not familiar with World Affairs Council Upstate, we're a program of Upstate International Center and we welcome you to check us out. Come and look at our website, give us a call, or come and attend some of our events and functions. We would love to get to know you. Um, for now, I'm going to thank also one more person, don't wanna forget, we have a very special sponsor for these online events today. Colonel David Davenport, US Army retired, has very graciously been supporting our programming so that we can bring these events free to the public. We want to thank you so much, uh, Colonel Davenport, for your ongoing support and bringing this opportunity to everyone in our region. Now I'm going to turn it over to Rob Rowan. Rob is the steer of the World Affairs Council Upstate Steering Board, and uh, we are so excited to have him introduce our special guest. Rob? Ah, welcome again. I hope you have a great lunch laid out in front of you as you get to hear what we have for today. Um, I want to say thank you again, David Davenport, a good friend who has been one of the people attending our regular American the World Series. And so here he is supporting us, and that's very really special. Our moderator is Nathan Stock, who moderated our last one. And um, Nathan's got a great little history about who he is, so we'll be appreciative. He's a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute. And before, prior to joining that, he spent nine years working for President Carter's organization, Carter Center. He served at the Center's Conflict Resolution Program out of Atlanta, Georgia, before moving to Jerusalem and then actually living in the Gaza Strip. And Nathan serves on the board of the World Affairs Council Upstate and is a um, great uh, addition to the community of the Greenville area. Uh, another person we have today, uh, one of our speakers who you will enjoy, is Bill Marshall. Uh, Bill has uh, 25 years as a COO and CFO of International Business Units for Dun & Bradstreet with a focus on renewable energy. Uh, he is heavily involved with the Citizens Climate Lobby and I met Bill down in St. Petersburg and I was impressed by his knowledge and uh, his commitment to the issues that we are talking about today and I'm glad Bill could join us and be part of this. And then we also have Dr. John Glenn, another great friend. Um, he happens to be the director at the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, where he leads engagement with the U.S. GLC's National Security Advisory Council. Uh, it, he also works with the State Department and U.S. Agency for AID, that's it, international development, and with also think tank communities. So he's uh, very, very involved in, in the world. But his other background is he teaches a graduate seminar on transatlantic relations at Georgetown's Walsh School of Foreign Service. And he serves as a member of the Halifax International Security Forum Agenda Working Group. That's a lot to say. <laughs> he previously served as Director of Foreign Policy at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, where he led programs to promote greater transatlantic cooperation and understanding during the crisis over the war in Iraq and is also as executive director of Council for European Studies. He's written many, many books, articles on foreign policy, global development, transatlantic relations, and democratization. 
and he holds a PhD and an MA from Harvard University, you may have heard of that school, and a BA from Oberlin. Now USGLC, which uh, is an organization working very hard to maintain funding for the State Department in trade, aid, all these different things that, have, that are essential for keeping America strong. Um, I really support that. Tracy and I are both on the South Carolina Advisory Board of USGLC, and we're both committed to that. And at that point, that's what I have to say, and I want to hand this over to Nathan. Thank you for coming again and being part of this. Uh, and let me uh, second Rob's thanks. Uh, we're so fortunate to have our presenters today and all of our guests. Uh, just another reminder to please keep your microphones muted and your video feeds turned off while Bill and John present. Uh, do, however, feel free to type questions into the chat function uh, in the course of their presentations or in the time we will allot for Q&A afterwards. Uh, once we move into the Q&A after Bill and John have finished, uh, I'll do my best to curate and read aloud uh, questions shared by our participants, more or less in the order that they're typed in. So with that, uh, please allow me to turn it over to Mr. Bill Marshall. Well, th thank you very much, Ian. I appreciate that. Appreciate it. And I appreciate uh, the Upstate uh, International for organizing the event and, and Rob for inviting me to participate. It, it's a pleasure. Um, I'm going to start with a few statements, facts uh, that I suspect most of the audience will easily relate to, and I'll hopefully uh, draw some useful data out of that as we go on. I'm going to talk for maybe six or seven minutes and then basically uh, talk about questions that people have. So think of issues uh, that you may want to be discussing with John or I. Um, I. I suppose the first fact is self-evident. The world is warming at an accelerating rate and it's primarily due to increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the warming is changing the global biosphere, which supports all of us. And in case uh, you haven't noticed through the COVID uh, epidemic, uh, national boundaries are meaningless when you talk about climate change. Developing nations and areas of the world are as much affected as developed ones. And there's no place to hide. There's no other earth. There's no place to go. We must deal with the problem we have um, in the best way we can. And I think to deal with the problem, we need to think about what is the cost. And again, I suspect that everyone knows this, but we are the cause. The use of carbon-based fuels, which release carbon dioxide when burned, is the main reason for global warming. And it happens also to be the lead sentence in, in this <laughs> description of today's event. So uh, for those of you who just felt uh, in my four or five points there, like I was one of our TV anchors reading the latest grim statistics uh, about the COVID pandemic, um, I would have to admit that the trend is discouraging. But there is still time to bend the carbon dioxide emission curve if we focus on economic solutions which drive um, human behavior. And probably the principal economic solution we need to concentrate on, and one we don't hear so much about in general comments about dealing with climate change, is price. Price. We need to wean ourselves off carbon-based fuels by pricing them to include the negative consequences of their use. And I think those negative consequences are now apparent to everyone, and therefore we need to price to discourage their use over time. Now, for anybody who has an investment and in, Exxon or likes oil companies, don't misread me. I'm not saying oil companies are bad. We need them and we'll probably continue to need them at some level for decades. And I appreciate that the uh, last 125 or 150 years of economic growth and development around the world uh, has been wonderful for billions of people. 
whose living standards have improved. And that improvement has been largely generated by ever more abundant carbon-based fuels. But the past is not a good reason to continue into the future. And indeed, we need to change the existing paradigm because it's rapidly undermining the improvements of the last 125, 150 years. So how do we do that? Well, we need to change by creating the correct economic framework to support innovation and adoption of clean energy sources. And there's really one framework that makes a lot of sense universally, and that's price. Businesses and individuals universally respond to price changes. They adapt, they innovate to find solutions which meet their, their business needs and personal needs when prices of things rise. Um, we can lead as individuals and business leaders to create climate friendly energy sources. The technology is available and where it isn't available, we can innovate our way forward. We simply need to act. And you may feel as individuals that, well, you're doing everything you can. But I'd like to suggest that ad hoc personal and business actions like buying LED lights or solar panels are great, but they're insufficient. They, they may uh, satisfy a, a nagging feeling of guilt that we all have as individuals about what's happening, but they don't help solve for the, economic, uh, the carbon dioxide problem in the time frame we need it. We need to deal with it. What we really need is an effective national policy and international policies to price carbon-based fuels and therefore encourage the adoption of clean energy sources. Um, let me give you uh, an example using the U.S. because that's an area I know a great deal about in this thought. And if we approach this in a methodical way as a policy decision, in the next 10 years, we can cut carbon dioxide emissions 40%. We're going to save almost 300,000 lives in the same period by the reduced impacts of climate change and grow the economy and create incremental jobs in the process. And perhaps most importantly, ensure that low and moderate income populations do not get penalized during the transition by gradually rising prices. This is often a concern and it's a justifiable concern because low and moderate income communities in the United States and around the world are some of the most affected by changes in prices and of course by climate change. Now, generically, uh, this, this approach is often referred to as a, an, a carbon fee and dividend. So think about it this way. You impose a gradually rising fee on the carbon content of fossil-based fuels, which when they get combusted, produce carbon dioxide. And you impose that fee near the point of production. So pretty far back near the coal mine, near the, near the oil well, maybe at the refinery. And you collect that fee at some sort of central level. In the United States, it would be collected by the US Treasury. But the most important thing about the collection of the fee is it is rebated back to all uh, citizens and legal residents as a dividend. Now, what that means is that most moderate income people, about 70% of the population, break even or come out ahead actually. Um, now, as I'm talking about that, those of you who are listening, it's, I feel sometimes it's kind of awkward uh, to do these things by like Zoom because I can't really see the audience, but you might be saying, well, that, I don't know, that sounds like a, a reasonable idea or maybe you think it's a crazy idea, but in any event, you think it can happen. 
And in the event, if it could happen, it could never be done outside the United States. But it has been. Canada has enacted legislation which prices carbon to accomplish this goal. And in the US, there's now bipartisan legislation pending in the House, which embodies this approach. It's the ener called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And 90 House members are supporting it. So that's, I don't know, roughly, whatever, 30, 25% of the House, I guess. Um, but action and leadership are what we need to create the proper economic framework for a decarbonized future in the US and the developing world. Uh, we need to act like our future depends on it and take actions that will lead us that way because our future really does depend on it. Um, and I guess I'd like to end these initial comments by making the following statement which rather ties into the title of today's events. And that I think a bias to action on climate crisis, on the climate crisis, is the only cost of a clean conscious on a dirty planet. And so with that, Ian, let me turn it back to you and uh, we'll pick up questions in, in the questions and answer session. There probably will be plenty. Yeah. Uh Thank you very much, Bill. That was great. Uh, please allow me to turn it over to Dr. John Glenn. Nathan, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's really great to be here. And I want to add my thanks to Rob and to Tracy for having me again. I've always appreciated the chance to come down and talk to you guys there. <laughs> now I can do so from my bedroom um, with this funny technology <laughs> we have here. I want to also uh, give a shout out to my colleague, Jeremy Tolbert. Uh, Jeremy leads uh, U.S. Global Leadership Coalition's work in South Carolina. And I hope many of you on the phone know him because it's a it's a really important piece of what he does is trying to find out the people who are in the business community the community leaders faith leaders retired military folks who care about global engagement and sort of bring them together on a broader platform um bill sort of set the stage for us i think really perfectly talking about the united states and the policies to deal with um, the causes and as yet as he said you know this is sort of a, a phenomenon that knows no borders and so I want to just sort of take my time briefly to talk a little bit about the global perspective. I think that everybody knows that this is a, a policy that will require or a problem that will require multifaceted solutions. And so I want to talk a little bit just super briefly about the kind of global agreements. In particular, I want to talk about the impacts on the developing world. And I want to highlight a few things. I want to highlight how climate change is what, some, what the Pentagon has called the threat multiplier. And so it's, a, it's an important piece for me to sort of make the case that um, we should, in my personal opinion, the matters and how we deal with the climate in it matter in and of themselves, but it really enriches it when I think about how it affects a lot of other things that matter to us around the world. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about some of the policies that we do and some of the programs and initiatives that try to address that in the developing world in particular. And I will super briefly touch on the COVID moment there, but leave a lot, I think, for the conversation there. So the first thing to put on the table is, of course, there is an international agreement, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. It's been in the press because the president has announced that the United States will be withdrawing from that. Formally, that happens later this year. But I want to highlight that one of the things to be clear about is this agreement, building on a change that happened when President George W. Bush was president, really shifted the, the global debate. It had initially emerged around the idea that there was the historical emitters of carbon and pollution, which were in developed countries like the United States and in Europe. And then there was the developing world, which hadn't really contributed to it. And so they were the ones who were sort of, it was a, almost a transfer from one to the other. But this shift really universalized it. The Paris Agreement on Climate Change is a universal agreement for 196 parties. I think it's 192 countries plus others there. Um, and everybody is agreeing that they will be responding to this. And of course, you know, we've seen that list of who's the largest emitters changes. China's tremendous industrialization has happened in other countries as well. So that identity about sort of who's the historical emitters versus who are the ones who are the, who have been suffering from it. And in particular in the developing world, um, you know, people who say, 
Well, yes, you know, Bill talked about the way that people's um, livelihoods have improved in many ways from this. There are people who say, well, as our economy grows, we would also like to have cars, not bicycles. We would also like to have refrigerators that can keep our food, you know, um, usable for, you know, in the short term. And so there's a kind of an interesting part to that that I think makes that universality really important. Each country decides for itself what it can and will achieve. And in the lead up to this agreement, the United States and China actually had the, an agreement that led to China to make its very first ever commitments that it had made at the global level. And then just for what it's worth, it was really clear that built into this, starting in 2023, every five years, countries would come back together, assess how they were doing, and change and target their revisions of what they were, uh, what their goals were, and how close they were to achieving them. So that piece is out there. There's the Paris Climate Agreement there. Um, but I really want to highlight, as I'd said, let me turn to the part about how this affects, um, there's a real clear consensus that climate change affects all of us, but disproportionately and the hardest. It affects the poorest and the most vulnerable. And that means emerging markets and countries, that means women and children in those countries. Um, right. And that these disruptions actually challenge and threaten our own security and economic interests. They, they drive mass displacement and refugees. They threaten progress on preventing conflict, combating hunger, poverty. So briefly, I'll mention just a couple of like facts to kind of dramatize that or make that clear there. So let's talk about the idea about conflict. You know, um, uh, extreme weather, as it's known, has contributed to conflict and terrorism in fragile states. It's led to there are now over 70 million people displaced from their homes. That's the largest number in history. It's the only time it was close was after World War II. And the estimate is that by 2050, more than 143 million people could be driven from their homes from conflict over food and water insecurity and climate-driven natural disasters. One of the clearest things that comes is this issue of hunger and water security. Because of course, as the environment heats up, it affects agriculture. It affects how we make food and what that happens. And the estimates that we have of the 124 million people last year who faced crisis levels of hunger, 76% were affected by climate shocks and extremes. And more than half the people in developing countries live in rural communities that are dependent on agriculture, which is highly vulnerable to environmental conditions. Now there are connections to health. You know, I'll talk about COVID a little bit at the end here, but, um, it's been clear that warmer temperatures have led in some cases, and it's funny contrast actually, the COVID conversation, to infectious diseases spreading more widely. You may remember the Zika crisis from a couple of years ago. Zika, Dengue, these kinds of disease actually have tripled in the way they've affected people from 2004 to 2016 because they're able to be, uh, grow and be spread in more places as they get warmer. The straight up economic development side is really important here. Um, I mean, the broadest estimates from the World Bank are that, that, that climate change could push 100 million people below the poverty line uh, in 2030. So if you think about it, there's so many ways this plays out, but major commercial ports, Rio de Janeiro, Mumbai, Guangzhou, Dar es Salaam, to sort of choose from around the world a little bit, they face the threat of being submerged by rising sea levels. And by 2050, it's estimated that 300 million people live in coastal areas threatened by dangerous flooding. My understanding is, is that South Carolina knows something about the threat of coastal flooding. Imagine, as much as a challenge as it is here, if you're in Mumbai and thinking about what kind of resources and what kind of technology they have to be able to respond to it. So America's, you know, the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, we often advocate and talk about the importance of investments in diplomacy and development. And here I do mean um, efforts by the State Department and the U.S. Agency for International Development to build resilience. Now, this is defined by most of the ability to mitigate, adapt to, and recover from shocks, natural disasters, and conflict to reduce the vulnerability. I mean, the sad truth is that where we are now, we must tackle the adaptation side. We're already too far down the path to be able to say, if we just change the uh, contributions that we made, we could change the path. We need to help people that are being affected already. I'll highlight just a couple. There's a powerful initiative that USAID does called um, Feed the Future, which has helped lift more than 23 million people from poverty 
um, and supports resistance, uh, excuse me, research, especially on climate resistant crops. So East Africa is this really interesting comparison area because you have right in Ethiopia, Feed the Future has been really active in helping farmers with um, drought resistant seeds, new technologies and early warning systems, but its neighboring countries aren't in there. And so this is, this is an area that has been traditionally vulnerable to severe droughts. I remember this way back from when I was in high school in the 1980s about, you know, live aid and all that issue. And this sort of chronic drought that hits them is something that you actually can see over time and compare that as we've made these investments in Ethiopia, you can compare the impact of the drought upon them in neighboring communities where those investments were made. And the estimates are they've reduced the impact by over 30%. They provided over 100,000 farmers with different varieties of um, the kinds of seeds that they use and change the way they farm. And that kind of resilience to these um, chronic droughts are kind of classic way. There's a lot of examples as well that are about increasing access to Cabo Verde, uh, to clean water. The example I have is the country of, of Cabo Verde, where it's estimated that 9% of households have access to a public water supply, and these conditions are constantly being made worse by a drought. And I can go into it a little bit more if you want, but some of the things that there's an uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, one of America's development agencies, has actually been working with that country to construct water infrastructure, and this has already been able to have a dramatic impact upon this. Now, when I talk about this impact, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the solutions and the financing. The UN and all of the UN member countries came together uh, a few years back for something that they called developing the sustainable development goals. And what I want to highlight about those that's interesting to me is, first of all, of course, they, they apply to everybody, just like the Paris Climate Agreement. But they tried to estimate what are the real costs, of the risks and the dangers that we face? And what will we need to do to get there? And one of the clearest things that shapes my thinking about climate change, um, and I think it's really consistent in some ways with the sort of framework Bill was talking about, was that there is no amount of official public dollars that are going to do that. The Sustainable Development Goals talk about the need to get from billions to trillions if we're actually going to be able to do this. And this leads for me as sort of a very fundamental piece that most of the global economic responses that we look at this have to do with public-private partnerships how you create opportunities so that public dollars can both leverage and catalyze with and create incentives for the private sector to get in line to be able to sort of make some of the investments that will be profitable for them. So there's this really great initiative that the World Bank and the UN launched called Invest for Climate. And its presence is not how do we spend public dollars, its presence, its purpose. It's really instead, how do you help city and national governments identify what the various investments are, identify potential projects. And there's projects that I found in West Africa and the Philippines and Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, where they're really seeking to find opportunities to build those kinds of public-private partnerships that are powerful there. Um, one of the tools I'll just put on the table for your knowledge there, that's part of the Paris Agreement, something called the Green Climate Fund. It's established in 2010. It's a partnership between of over 190 countries, again, seeking to use public investments to catalyze private finance. Um, it's raised over $10 billion since 2014, and it really addresses the sort of full range of projects that are needed around there. Now, you know, when I think about who's involved, the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition members involved, many of the sort of NGOs who are involved in the world, and some of you on this call here may work for organizations that have a global presence. And of course, there are hundreds of NGOs, nonprofit organizations that care about this issue and work on it. There are business leaders from around this country that also absolutely recognize and drive this. Um, there was a powerful letter in 2018 signed by over 50 global business leaders that represented companies that generated more than $1.3 trillion in revenue in 2017. They called climate change a major threat to the environment, societies, to our economy, and endangering our well-being and prosperity. And so it's a lot of ways about how we align those pieces together. It's a lot more that could be said. But let me talk just for a second about COVID. Um, it's been really, really interesting, I think, to watch sort of how, how this shapes people's perceptions because a lot of the folks who work on climate change are saying, you see, this is the kind of threat like climate that calls for dramatic action. And there've been these really sort of interesting, compelling stories in some ways about how pollution levels have declined dramatically. So they say, look, if you look in New Delhi, they can see the Himalayas for the first time. In Venice, the canals are clearer. Um, 
I, I keep every now and then I read crystal clear and I haven't been to Venice. I'm not sure crystal clear is right, but they're clearer. <laughs> um, and so I think that in some ways it's you sort of say, oh, look, here's the potential. But I want to highlight that this has come at such dramatic costs. We, we're estimating 22 million people unemployed in the United States right now. And the folks I know and respect who work on these climate issues say it's, it's not the right frame. You know, these impacts are sh certain to be short lived. And the solution that we want has to be one that is not come at a cost per se, solely to economic gain and to unemployment and to employment. But it's really how you create that bit to sort of make sure that our economic prosperity is linked to and high, tied to climate challenges. And the risk I think here, if I, as I think about it, is that the impact on COVID is gonna make it harder for us to make the commitments that we've made already on climate change. If we're looking at a potential you know, recession that's gonna come up, it's gonna be hard to have the goals met that people set up for climate financing. And the World Economic Forum estimates $5.7 trillion is needed for effective climate change mitigation and adaptation. But economists are already predicting that COVID could cost the global economy more than $2.7 trillion this year alone. I mean, there's a real worry that we have about how this, it's de derailed climate diplomacy. 2020 was to be the UN Climate Change Conference. They're not gathering now, of course not, the way this is happening there. This has been pushed to 2021, and it was intended to be a deadline that would drive tougher emission reduction targets and plans. So I think it's created uh, hurdles that are, people are going to have to integrate with it. But I want to say, you know, there are, there are those as well who sort of said we have to come back and integrate. There's an interesting plan that's found out there by two former secretaries of state, James Baker and George Schultz, who say that a well-designed climate policy could speed up and strengthen our economic recovery from the coronavirus while charting a course for a sustainable future. I'm someone who wants to believe and, and believes that that's the only way forward is for us to sort of look at how we align what it is that we're doing um, in the public sphere, what we're doing in diplomacy and development, what we're doing at home, and how we're aligning the private sector. Um, and so I think that's a lot I put on the table there, but there's so much to talk about that I wanted to, I hope that might have sparked some thoughts and be an interesting way to set the table for a conversation with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That's fantastic. Uh, we have a couple of questions already in our chat function. Uh, the first comes from Tracy Fries, Executive Director of Upstate International. Um, she notes that as far back as the early 1900s, there are reports of Thomas Edison and Henry Ford talking about uh, the need to move toward renewable sources of energy. If luminaries such as they were having these conversations a century ago, why has this taken so long? Either you, of you oh, oh, uh, chime in. All right, well, let, let me start and then let John chime in. I, before I answer that question, I just want to say that, that John presented a rich, very rich picture of the many, many, many aspects that we have to think about with climate change. So going back to 150 years ago, um, <laughs> what's happened is that the technology is available today or has been created over the last 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years that did not exist when Thomas Edison was around. And primarily, um, it's about solar power. It's about the improvements in battery power that, and of course, wind power. Uh, so those potential technologies just were not available um, 100 years ago. And I think the other thing, and it goes back why I argue so uh, uh, much about price, we need to keep in mind that technology and the development of technology is stimulated by the price on the product or service that it is serving. So if um, if horses and buggies were cheaper than uh, automobiles today, we'd probably be using horses and buggies um, in spite of their environmental impact. Uh, but they're not. Cars and 
petroleum-based fuels are. And the same thing applies to the implementation of, of other technology. And one of the reasons that um, it's so important to think about pricing carbon around the world is because it makes every other effort, money of which John just talked about, economically more expensive because it's always competing against the artificially low price of carbon. So let me, let me stop and let John jump into that, Ian. Well, thank you. You know, I, I always remember one of the um, moments when I really sort of felt like I clicked and understood some of the points you're making about pricing was when I, this is, I don't know, about 15 years ago, went to a presentation where there were some businesses there and they said, listen, I, I almost don't care what the price is. I, I, I just want to know because then I can plan right. around it. And, I, and it right. sort of really kind of come away unlocked for me that kind of idea that somehow business and the climate were opposed to each other. And the business folks were saying, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. I mean, sure, I'd like it to cost less. I mean, yes, of course, in some general sense. But what I really need is the predictability. And if I can do that, then I can plan my economic you know, models around that. But you highlight, Bill, you know, this question about price. Um, Nathan, I don't want to steal your role here, but you know, when I was preparing for this, I was thinking about how, of course, the price of these coal technology of uh, gas, of course, has fluctuated a lot. And here we are recently, it just plummeted down to what was this period where it was like negative pricing on futures on it this way. Right. I assume this creates huge hurdles right now for, you know, the affordability of renewables and other alternative technologies. And I just was dying to hear your thoughts about that. Well, um, is that a jump in? Yeah, please. Uh, clear, clearly, um, the price of carbon-based fuels going down is uh, doesn't help the adoption of others. And, yeah. and you referred to it in in your comments about well, where does the public money and the right. to, to do things in the climate area come from? But I don't think the price will be down uh, forever, and it certainly wouldn't be down if we started imposing on an annual basis a $15 a ton on the carbon content of fossil-based fuels and steadily increase that over the next 20, 25 years and, and rebated the money back as I was talking about. But the important thing is, as you talked about, the predictability of the price because businesses, I mean, the worst thing I hated when I was running businesses for Dun & Brand Street was uncertainty. You don't want things to come up and mess you up and so if you can plan you will plan accordingly now we weren't in a very you know information businesses aren't very intensive from a from a carbon point of view but other businesses it's the same thing so um and just to um, suggest two other things the support for pricing is is actually broader than um, i think most people appreciate and you talked about the baker uh, plan that that is a proposal basically by a business organization, the Climate Leadership Council, right. and Citizens Climate Lobby is a grassroots organization of about 185,000 people that's for the last 15, about 13 years has been pushing that kind of solution. Mm. So it just suggests mm. that there is much broader support mm. and what we need is action on the part of individuals to make it happen. And I, I want to throw this in right now because you talked a lot about the international consequences in developed countries of what is happening. And unfortunately, I agree, I'm not only unfortunate, I agree a thousand percent with it, but the unfortunate part is Yale uh, climate uh, does some climate polling every uh, year. And one of the 28 questions they ask is, do you think as an American, climate change is going to, global warming is going to affect me personally? Mm. And the response rate is about 30%, meaning most Americans seem oblivious to the effects of climate change. Now, 150 million people moving has big impacts on climate change and all the food uh, that we consume 
does not necessarily come from the Great Plains. And by the way, if the Great Plains turns into a desert, that may be great for Canada, but it may not be so good for our food supply. So let me go back to you. Or to Ian. Uh, let me allow some of our other guests to jump in with questions. Um, we have a, a question from uh, Rick Joy, you know, who's in our audience, and then Rob Rowan, our board chair. These two, I think, align nicely. Um, Rick, uh, Rick asks if either of you could speak to how the ability of governments around the world, including our government, to spend unprecedented sums of money in COVID response might speak to a future capacity to spend in the trillions to address climate change? Is it, is it a sign that if, if there were political will mustered to do this now, that in some future scenario, we might do that as regards to climate? Uh, and then Rob Rowan asked a related question, uh, what more can be done to address the enormous differences in the ability of different countries to, to pay, to spend money on this, right? The United States versus, say, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, would, would you like to address that? Well, I can start with the second part there, and then I think, um, let's see where Bill wants to chime in there. So I think, you know, there's a way that I worry about the direct analogy for the, the reasons that I said at the beginning there about this idea. People say, actually, isn't it great? Look, we can see the Himalayas from New Delhi. Great, we can see clearer in the canals in Venice. Um, because it sort of mistakes um, the tremendous costs that have been imposed on our economies and on our societies in order to respond to this pandemic. Um, it certainly shows that quick action is possible, but it also comes with tremendous cost. And if we don't keep those things together, I worry that it's not the sort of way that I think we need to be thinking about it as a, as a, as a nation and as a, as a world in some ways as a, to be how we address that broader piece. But I think that it highlights just one other, one, another way I see this analogy. And so it's right now, what we're doing on the COVID side is almost entirely focused domestically. And that's right. We've got a lot of, we've got, you know, people whose livelihoods have been um, lost. We've got people whose lives have been lost. But it's this sort of thing where we're, I feel like all the experts are saying we're like in the quiet before the storm in the developing world. Uh, the International Rescue Committee released a report yesterday that estimates that there could be between 500 million and a billion COVID-19 infections in 34 conflict affected and fragile states. And so if you do the math of how many people they think die from infections, that means up to 1.7 to 3.2 million deaths in countries that have no health systems. You look at Yemen now, 50% of their hospitals don't work. In Syria, health systems, hospitals, doctors were targets of the conflict. The impact, even if they're off by a scale of such, is so dramatic. And we're at this moment now, because there isn't testing, and because of the pattern of the way this disease is spread, in part due to air, air travel, um, where I think we're in the, what we have to assume is gonna be the quiet before the storm. And these are the moments where we hear it as a similar echo to the notion on climate, right? Now, if we don't act now, and so how do we create that urgency? And I think it's challenging because it's one that talks about scenarios. You know, a lot of my comments you'll notice were about sort of, look, if we assume this and we this, how do we come up with the estimates of how many people will be affected by um, droughts and extreme weather in terms of their livelihoods and agriculture around the world, in terms of water safety, water security, and having clean water. Um, and so I think that it's one of the things where we have to recognize there's a, there's a frame here about, you know, um, our military leaders uh, at the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition penned an op-ed about COVID, and they said, you know, you pay now or you can pay later. And when you pay later, you pay more. Um, and so I think that what we have to be able to do is to make that case to folks. But I feel like we also have to be able to make the case that we show that there is change that is possible. And that's a really important piece of that. There's no question that political will is critical to that. But I think that it needs to be the sort of issue about how we define that will in a way that um, 
is, has a positive looking vision for our country, both in terms of climate, both in terms of health, the analogy right now, but also in terms of our economy. And those are the things that, that's why I, I'm intrigued, Bill, to hear that you guys, citizens, that's great, are interested in the, this, the Climate Leadership Council's one, because that sort of approach of whether it's, if you call it public-private, or the way that you see that is the kind of solution that is one that tries to look at as well as people's livelihoods and well-being as a whole. I mean, it's kind of a broad way in there. But Bill, what do you think? Well, um, I think um, that, first of all, <laughs> there is some limit ultimately about the amount of debt you can create. I don't know what that is. Right. unless you believe in the monetar modern monetary theory of finance, but at some point people expect to get paid back for debt. Not, so uh, I hate to think of throwing $5 trillion at climate, I mean, at, and, and $5 trillion at the next pandemic, et cetera, because eventually uh, it, it will catch up to us in one way or another. Um, I think another way to think about it is that this is, we're kind of uh, climate, COVID is very immediate people die in a month, climate just keeps gradually creeping up on us. Yeah. And the, the analogy that's often used is it's kind of like a frog that's sitting in warming water and it just gradually gets warmer and warmer and warmer and boils to death rather than jumping out because it doesn't realize what's happening. And that's how I feel we are and why we need to have action. And when I think about, and I haven't verified these figures personally, but I've heard them in the last week from someone I consider to be highly reliable, that the fossil fuel industries around the world in direct and indirect subsidies total $5 trillion. Mm. And the actual subsidy in the U.S. to fossil mm. fuels is about the size of the U.S. Department of Defense budget, which is about $700 billion. So... Over time, if we made carbon more expensive, um, we would gradually reduce the amount of subsidy that would be occurring to those industries because they would not, they would gradually be declining and industries that came into existence uh, would not be subsidized. And so you would free up revenue to deal with some of the, not only the national issues, but the global issues, which truly other, in many ways. And I, I'll, I'll end on that national security comment by saying, global warming uh, is, is allowing cruise ships to cross the North Pole. Uh, it, it also means that in a, probably 20 years, uh, Russia will have an 8,000 mile sea frontier, which it has never had in its history. And so what does that mean for geopolitical uh, relations with Canada and Russia and the United States and Russia? And if you multiply those events all over the world, you talked about some of the uh, cost of do it now or do it later. Well, some defense installations, including McDill Air Force Base, where I am, over the next 50 years, 40 years, are going to be inoperative because they're going to be underwater. And so the inability to change now and do things gradually now is going to impose big costs later on. But the question is, you bring up, how do we get people to do that? And that's why I have such a strong bias towards action uh, to create the political will so that elected representatives know that we want this done and need it done. Can I chime in a little comment there? You sure. know, it's, uh, sure. So I used to work a lot on U.S.-Europe relations, and um, any time that I would sort of talk to the Europeans, they would always focus, understandably, at the national level. They'd say, oh, what's the president doing? And in recent years, the U.S. decision to pull out of the Paris climate change has been sort of greeted with, you know, great dismay in this. And, and in its, of its own right, it's fine. We could talk about that. I think there's an issue there. But what I often end up saying to them, and Bill, I wonder if you know more about this too, is that they, if they look at the national level in the United States, they actually miss much of what's going on that's really interesting in climate right now. That a lot of the states and mayors of cities are actually driving some really innovative stuff. And I have to admit, as, a, as an American who thinks about himself coming from a big country, 
there's a part of which that resonates with me as being, we're really different. We're a large country. It's not the same in Florida as it is in Seattle. And so I'm intrigued by the amount of um, effort. And I'm not going to say it's a substitute for national action or national and international action, but I I feel like it's such an interesting and important area that in some cases could have quite dramatic impacts. You know, the example that's often used is the auto emissions in California. You know, California itself is such a huge economy. I don't remember the number. Isn't it something like if California was its own country, it'd still be one of the top 10 economies in the world? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. You know, and so if California sets emission standards, in other words, if you're going to sell cars in California that meet a certain standard, you're going to shape the, the playing field for it. And so that has always been the um, sort of example in my mind about how it actually can make a big difference. But I don't know, what do you think about those efforts, Bill? I mean, are they part, part of the plan? Well, um, I guess my personal reaction is that I, I agree with you. There are, are good things happening locally and on a county, maybe even a state basis in time time. But I think why a national policy is so important hmm. is because the cost of those efforts is higher than it would otherwise need to be because hmm. the technologies and the processes they're using are competing against an artificially low price of petroleum. So um, it, if you're in St. Petersburg, Florida, there's a massive effort, or I mean massive for St. Petersburg, which is a city of you know, 260,000 people, uh, to do something to become uh, more environmentally friendly. And, and they want to do lots of things, and I'm not going to try and enumerate them, but all those efforts, the cost of them is undermined by the competing cost of doing things the way we are doing them, lower prices of carbon-based fuels and the systems that support those. So unless we change that dynamic in the United States and around the world, it is going to be very difficult or it is going to be more difficult and more expensive and less efficient, therefore, uh, in, to accomplish our, our energy goals. And and in, in, in a very, very broad global sense, in my opinion, it means there are less resources available to help underdeveloped areas who have problems and don't have the resources because there is only a certain amount of resource. I mean, unless you keep doing $5 trillion stimulus plans. Uh, but we need, and therefore, we should encourage the proper pricing of our for sure carbon-based yeah. fuel system so on that note we have a question from one of our guests janice baines uh, she notes that um, greenhouse gases from agriculture and deforestation are also a major driver of climate change bill do you envision a similar carbon pricing scheme being applied to agriculture and would that push up food costs and i would just add a, a clarifying question from my side could you say a bit more about how you see the dividend rebate working in the United States? Mm. Is that something that um, consumers, say, buying gas at the pump would see increased costs up front, but then get some lump sum in their tax return at the end of the year? And if so, um, how would that work for, for people who are poor and, and may have more difficulty addressing uh, uh, higher cost of consumer goods. All right, well, let me take the second of those first uh, because it, in a way it's easier to answer. The concept is, and it's embodied in the uh, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, and it's been supported by Citizens Climate Lobby for 12 years, is that you place a fee on the carbon content of fossil-based fuels at a national level. That fee is collected by the treasury effectively. It's put in a bucket and every month that fee is rebated out in the form of a direct payment to your checking account or a check to every citizen in the United States. Now in year one, that might be $200 a year for a family of four, but after 10 years, it's about $4,500 for a family of four. So it sounds like a lot of money and it is a lot of money, but the way that you would expect you would expect gasoline prices to be going up about 10 to 15 cents a gallon just based on that fee 
So gasoline prices are going to go up. Your embedded electricity costs are going to go up because maybe Duke Energy or whoever the energy company is has to pay higher prices. Um, and so you will get embedded costs, but the, the estimates are that you'll be a family of four would be getting about $4,500 a year after 10 years, and their energy costs embedded and direct would be up about $3,600 a year. So at a certain point, you have a net gain. Now that net gain tends to stop at around, I don't know, it depends on where you are in the country, $100,000, $125,000 a year for a family of four. And, it, and you have a slight cost if you're in the more wealthy uh, income brackets, the upper one-fifth uh, or upper quintile, actually. And, and, but often those people, uh, <laughs> they have more to lose by climate change than four or $500 a year they might pay in higher energy costs. You know, maybe they own property on the water. Maybe they have two homes and one of them's in a tornado belt or something. So in aggregate, most people come out ahead and we get the right kind of behavior. Now, th does that answer, do you think, does exactly. that answer your question? Okay. Yes. So comes back monthly, everybody gets it who's a citizen or a legal resident by check or by direct payment. All right, well, let me talk a little bit about the uh, uh, agriculture. Um, the concept of pricing carbon-based fuels and the carbon content is, is to allow all points of um, production to be captured and therefore have to become more efficient. So if I'm, if I'm a big cattle feedlot in, um, um, I don't know, wherever, Iowa, um, yes, my cows are releasing a lot of methane. And methane traps heat 20 times at a greater percentage of carbon dioxide but it also doesn't last a thousand years. It only lasts about 20 or 25 years. But the important thing about that is that if it's more expensive to transport meat and refrigerate meat and et cetera, et cetera, in the whole economic chain, there might be over time a lot less meat produced. And we might find that plant-based diets not only are more climate friendly, but are healthier to our cholesterol levels and everything else. And we may find that pricing carbon as a way of modifying people's behaviors without requiring it by law. I mean, I don't want to be told I can't have filet mignon once a year, but maybe I'll have it twice a year if it's a lot more expensive because it is more expensive to produce, more expensive to transport, et cetera. And the concept of pricing carbon is, is part of a package of solutions to dealing with climate change. It happens to be, I think, essential because if you don't price carbon, you are competing at an artificially low price. But there, there could well be other actions that take place to regulate or, or discourage the production of other heat trapping gases, as, as in the case of agriculture. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. This comes from Tracy Fries with Upstate International. Um, she asked uh, to Bill, but uh, John, feel free to also jump in with a final comment. What kind of feedback has the Citizens Climate Group received from big industry? I mean, are, are the, where are the big players out there on carbon fees? Well, I think... Uh, John probably hit the nail on the head that there's a lot of support for carbon pricing. It doesn't mean everybody supports it, but anybody is in business who thinks about it uh, realizes that they live on the planet too. Their customers live on the planet. And what they want to know is where we're going in a way so they can, so they can plan. Um, and I, so I think biz, big business and small business are all in the same boat. They realize we need to do something. They just want to know what, and they want to move towards it. Now, we're never going to please everybody. There would always be someone who's unhappy. John, do you want to jump into that? You know, I think all I want to observe is that it's one of these issues that has felt like it's um, divided people uh, for a long time. And it's one of those issues that when I look at polling and I look at the debate, I'm wondering if that's going to change, that if there's a generational side to this.
uh, if there's a side to which, in fact, as we go forward, it's not going to matter what part of the country you're in as much. It's not going to matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. But if, they're a young, if you're a younger person, this is a really important priority to you as you look ahead. And that has the potential, at least, to be a driving force behind any notion of political will behind it. And, you know, uh, we'll see, of course, I understand. Uh, I'm a sociologist by training and I understand the difference between cohort effects and others. <laughs> but at the same time, I think there's a sense that there, um, there is a kind of an awareness that has the potential to be broader on this. And I, so I'm, I'm hopeful that, that that informs the sort of broader debate as we look ahead there. Right. No, I, and, and, and to echo that, there is no doubt that there is a generational uh, divide on this. And uh, it's kind of sad because older people, some older people say, well, it's not my problem, let them worry about it. Other, a lot of others say, no, it is a problem. But uh, I've probably talked on face-to-face -face six or 7,000 people over the last seven years volunteering with Citizens Climate Lobby and almost all young people. When I say young, I don't know, under the age of 30, 35, are ardent supporters of action for climate change because they realize they're going to pay the big, big price of inaction. Can I leave one last thought there, Nathan? I'll hand it to you. There is, um, you know, at the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, we talk about why is um, there such a vision for this? Why is it important? And I always am reminded and love the expression that you know the genius of Eisenhower and Truman back in the fifties was not that they wanted to build a better and a safer world for themselves. It was that they wanted to build a better civil world for their children and their grandchildren. Right. And it's that motivation that is what so much makes us look forward. Well, we're out of time, but that is a great note to wrap up on. I want to thank Bill and John very much for your time today. I think this was a great presentation and a great exchange. Uh, finally, I would like to invite all of you to our next event in this series. Um, a week from tomorrow, that's May the 7th from 12 to 1, we will be hosting Dr. Michelle Gelfand. She's a professor at the University of Maryland and the author of Rule Makers, Rule Breakers, How Tight and Loose Cultures Wire the World. Uh, Dr. Gelfand will be discussing how different cultures' responses to COVID have impacted the crisis. Uh, there's more information on our website. So uh, with that, we can close up. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's really Thank great you. to be with you. Yeah, great to be here. Likewise.